lot of communication happening and a lot of folks who are, you know, every time there's a hiccup, they look to see what we can do to fix that, prevent that from happening uh, in the future. So a couple of just takeaways on this, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I'm just very impressed by the, the numbers from, from, of those who, of our employees in particular, who have uploaded uh, their verification or uh, requested some kind of uh, accommodation. We're in really a very high number uh, in terms of our overall vaccination rates. So this is really positive. I think it bodes well for the future of the campus. Um, one one uh, you know thing I just want to thank you for is, is in advance is being as flexible as you can with students, helping them to stay away when they are sick. I know that this uh, can be disruptive, particularly as you're doing your instruction in your courses, right? I also just want to get sort of put out there that you know we're, we're not in the background somewhere keeping score. Uh, about what's happening in individual courses, right? There's not, none of that's happening. We, we do need you to exercise your uh, best judgment about, you know, when your class should be meeting, when it should end, what's the best, what's in the best interest of your students and, and so forth, right? If you need guidance on that, you know, please speak to your dean or your chair. Um, but uh, I think just broadly want to communicate that, um, you know, we, we, you know, this operation at the university depends on uh, faculty being self-directed and self-motivated, right? And we have a framework for dealing with COVID. But within that, there's some discretion for uh, you as a faculty member to, to do what you think is best uh, for your uh, particular your particular situation and your, with your, your students and what you know about your class. Um, so let me move on to a couple of other things. Uh, so uh, on the budget front, uh, I was... Uh, you know, pleased to see what we did in SRPC, and I want to thank the president for the transparency. Some of those, some of the information was really very, very helpful. Right, it helped to set the stage for a lot of important conversations we'll be having uh, this year. Um, the, at the division level, we were fortunate enough to receive an allocation from the state for six hundred twenty-six thousand to support ethnic studies. And uh, before the end of the week, I'll be sending out a uh, call for uh, folks to serve on an advisory committee to advise the provost and the division about the ways in which that money can be effectively spent to promote our ethnic studies uh, departments, uh, meet the ethnic studies requirement, and, and generally scale up our operations in that area. There's some exciting opportunities here, and uh, I'm looking for some broad representation from across the division, um, especially looking for those of you who have been active in the Ethnic Studies Council uh, to uh, join this uh, advisory committee. So next week, uh, our, the third item for me next week, we have on September 9th at 3 p.m. a uh, WASC uh, reaccreditation town hall kickoff event. Uh, this uh, is the first in what will be a multi-year conversation. It's going to be fairly short, our sort of initial meeting. It's just going to be mostly about what the process looks like. And also, we'll have a call in for uh, faculty and staff representation on the steering committee that we're uh, creating. So uh, that's uh, September 9th at, at 3 p.m. If you don't know, we're, uh, in, we'll be beginning what's called the thematic pathway to reaffirmation. That's a, a, a ability to have uh, do our reflection and reaccreditation process by looking at particular themes. And our task over the next six months is to identify those themes and then submit them to us for approval. So uh, there are opportunities for you to be involved, and I uh, hope that you will, will be. Even if you're not on the committee, there will be plenty of other opportunities for input and uh, participation in this process. And then finally, I, I just uh, wanted to uh, say that one of the things I enjoy about being provost is uh, hearing about the good things that are happening in the division. And so I wanted to thank Dean Coley, uh, made my day today by sending out yesterday and uh, link to the the uh, LA Times and uh, Dr. Frank Barajas had a was interviewed there and uh, by one of my favorite columnists and I thought wow that was really cool I don't know Frank how you, how you if you got to meet him in person I, I haven't met him but uh, I put that link in in the um, chat so w w folks would I really like to hear about these things uh, 
you know, Dr. Perchak shared with shared with us recently that she recently published something in Italian. I was like, wow, I can't even aspire uh, to do that. That's that's amazing. So keep that good work, get good work coming. Uh, I like to really, it's an enjoyable part of the job to uh, see the good stuff that our uh, faculty are doing. So great work. All right, that's all for me at this point, and I'm happy to you know answer any questions as as I'm sure the president is. Thank you. Um, so let's take uh, let's take questions, um, and I guess um, Jason, would you uh, would you like to take a, a speakers list, or if people want to just raise their hand, uh, I'll, I'll keep the speakers list. Um, okay. It seems like there's been a rich presentation, and there's a possibility that might be the most effective way to go. But I think Allison is she around? She had. I the am. I am still here. Do you want to ask the question? Yeah, yeah I actually, I, I have two. Jason, I'll leave the first one for, for you because you had the same question. And I just have a second one. Um, I'm going to stick with the perhaps more annoying one, but I'm going to also thank the provost for his kind um, shout out. So about the WASC thing, the answer may just be because we have to, but why are we having to do a thematic reaccreditation? Why can't we just do a straight accreditation without themes? And I ask this only because it sounds like there's an extra like six months involved in coming up with the themes and then working around the themes. Is there a simpler way to do that? Or maybe that is the simpler way, but this it's just the, like, it sounds weird to me, frankly. Yeah, no, so this is the simpler way and the more effective way and the way that'll be most uh, valuable uh, to the campus. So the alternative, it, what it does is it allows us to not do a bunch of things that we would otherwise do during the accreditation process that would maybe just be spinning our wheels, right? And so campuses that have done this have found it to be a valuable exercise and so we're looking, for example, to Long Beach, who's recently done it, uh, gone through the same process, and we've already uh, uh, talked uh, with them about this. So uh, yeah, it's actually uh, the best thing that we can do. And um, what, one of the things we learned from uh, Long Beach when we talked to them was that they said, whatever you do, don't just choose your themes. Um, and announce them, you actually have to engage the campus in, uh, and selecting those themes, right? And so that's what this is about. I don't think it's going to be an onerous uh, task. I think it will be pretty straightforward to identify uh, some themes. But I, we do want to use it just as sort of as a stage setting to run up uh, to our accreditation process. One other thing I'll just say that will happen uh, that this committee that we're putting together will be charged with is actually making recommendations on the formal steering committee for reaccreditation, which will form in the spring, right? And uh, so that's we're not when I we haven't determined that, that membership there, and that part of the what's happening this in this pre-planning process is uh, to make some recommendations on uh, that membership there. So I, I know, Alison, it sounds like we're doing some, a little bit of additional work, but uh, actually this is going to be far less work and far more effective for the campus in the, over, in the long term. Um, okay, good, Alison. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Sean Anderson. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the updates. Um, <clears throat> a a couple, couple questions. The first one is just to say... Um, uh, fueling a lot of questions, this, sorry, uh, fueling a lot of questions and a lot of stress around notifications. Um, and, and maybe this was addressed, I, I was in the waiting room for a while, so maybe this was addressed, if so I apologize. But um, uh, just, I'm not, we're not getting any information. So I, for example, am getting emails from students saying that they're, that campus has told them they're not allowed to be in a classroom, but there's nothing on the MyCI Go app and, and it goes on and on and on. So there's very little confidence in the communication of, of status and what have you. And, and from the perspective of uh, myself, at least, but I think several of my chair colleagues, it seems to be not working. Um, and we feel like we're in the dark uh, by and large with regards to student status, et cetera. That's one. Number two is um, I just want to convey um, how, uh, <laughs> how incredibly stressed uh, many of the chairs are and faculty. We are in a desperate situation with regards to staffing. I can't, I can't overemphasize this enough. So some, 
some people have no help um, in terms of administrators, in terms of techs, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to think about enrollments and planning and all this and that when we, 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 we just don't have the, the, the help to do the basic functioning of a regular year, let alone a COVID year. So I was wondering if you guys could address how, how maybe you've been strategizing or thinking about how we might be able to um, really hit this immediate dire staff need uh, in the next week or two. I, I'd love to hear if you guys have suggestions. Thank you. Well, I'll jump in and then I'll turn over to Mitch and maybe some of the, the folks with EHS and student affairs who are doing some of the notification pieces. But from a staffing perspective, Sean, I, you know, a lot of it really depends. You know, how do we fill those vacant positions? I know you have some vacancies throughout academic affairs. Um, that's, we got to fill those. And, you know, whoever's in charge of filling those, like, Sean, if you're the chair, then fill those positions. Uh, you know, get the searches going or do an emergency hire, or do a temporary hire, whatever we need to do. If there are needs for additional uh, staffing beyond those budgeted lines, that's part of the budget process, right? That needs, to, that needs to go through the budget process. That being said, there's lots of ways to navigate it internally until that process comes. You can look at existing funds, put it together, and fill, fill a role temporarily, and then get that going, and then put in a budget request. So there's, there's some things that you can do in interim, but I... I, and this was a big point of discussion, Sean, at SRPC, and believe me, I've heard it not only from academic affairs, but all the way across. If you look at those slides, you'll, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, student affairs was 20% down um, in, in their, their vacancies, you know? So um, that's that, and I'll let Mitch chime in there, and then I'll jump in on the, the other piece. But Mitch, I don't know if anything you want to add there. Yeah, so uh, all of the, as far as I know, in, really in arts and sciences, uh, but vision-wide is whenever there's a vacancy, we move as media, immediately as as possible to get the job uh, reposted. Uh, we can do emergency hires if we have, if we know of a candidate, we can bring somebody in, uh, in for an emergency hire while we're actually running uh, the search, right? So that, that's, a, that's a possibility as well. Um, I also, um, we do have an agency that we work, work with, right? If we need to do, go bring in folks immediately from an agency, um, I don't know always that you know, I don't know necessarily that the skill sets meet, but it's at least uh, a topic worth uh, propo uh, proposing and considering. So, yeah, I, th I think it's it's clear we're struggling with uh, staffing uh, campus-wide. Uh, academic affairs is, is an example of that, uh, but as much as possible, we're working to uh, get those positions posted as quickly quickly as we can and fill them as, as quickly as we can. When, if we're talking, it, so, I don't know, Sean, if we're talking about uh, vacancies uh, that, that just happened or if there's sort of long-term staffing uh, needs. The long-term staffing needs, I think, are a slightly different conversation. But, uh, you know, we do have resources and ability to uh, find folks temporarily to help uh, fill in those uh, those gaps, right? So That, that would be um, great. That, I mean, that, I totally appreciate that. I, I um, we just hired a technician, and that's great. It took six months to get a new technician, and that was relatively fast. Um, yeah. So I, I think, and I hear what you're saying, the skill sets might not match up with, uh, I don't know, nursing lab simulator, but right. at least for some of the HR administration stuff, it would be, it would be wonderful if we could indeed tap into the, the temporary pool at some local agency or something. Because I mean, there yeah. really are just some things that are breaking because we just can't do the most basic, uh, there aren't just enough right. hours in the day kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I will say this, you know, and I, I pushed back a little in the SRPC meeting because they're, they're, I wanted to make sure that I was explicitly clear that I want, to, I want to fill all these positions. We're not saying don't fill them or try to make do. Like I've talked to every single cabinet member, fill those staffing positions. We have to. It's, it's imperative. And I hear the stress. I hear people you know, overworked. And, and that's nothing new here. But it, it's hard enough when we're fully staffed. And the fact that we're so down. So please, move forward with those searches. I, I, I don't know what else to say, but I... You know, I just I want to make that explicitly clear that you know we're we're fully supportive of filling these vacancies. Um, Sean, as as it relates to the notifications, you know, there's a lot of back end work there, so a lot of that is manual. Um, so I don't know what the extent, Sean, is. I mean, compared, you know, we're talking about of, of the the in person students who are requiring testing right now because they haven't uploaded their their verifications yet. So we're talking just over 800 students as of yesterday. Uh, you know, we're at 85%, right? It's just remaining 15%. So we're working with, you know, about 800 students navigating that on the back end. 
I felt pretty good about the process, but like I said, I'm not sure where the breakdowns are, but we're working on that. I'll, I'll turn it over to anybody, to Joyce or, or Cindy, uh, for some of you working on, on the back end there to provide a little bit of context. And, and Sean, I would guess that there's a lot of individual variability depending on the case. Because a student might have got a notification, gotten tested, and they're not on your list or submitted their verification. So, But that's just one example, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Joyce and Cindy to see if they have anything they want to add. Um, let me uh, speak to the notification piece. So students are given notice on Friday, so the first one went out last week, um, that they were not permitted on campus. Um, we, you know, we're not able to then re-notice them once they've come into compliance. The students will know that they have entered that compliance piece and people have emailed our office and we've tried to walk them through what was missing. I will say that um, the two key things the student this last week could have done to come into compliance would have been to upload their vaccination record uh, in the certification portal or to have completed a COVID test. Um, and then I will say that actually our numbers of people who are required to test right now are in the range of 1,500. And that is because uh, when President Yao was referencing a smaller number he was focused on those students who have one or more in-person classes. One of the challenges for students who are enrolled uh, in all online classes is that they think, well, I'm online, I don't need to pay attention to this, but that's not true. That actually is a COVID-19 certification status that I do not intend to come to the campus, all my classes are online, I will not be engaging in person in any university related activities that is a status that they can assert okay. uh, and it doesn't require any documents um, the data that's pushing out to faculty then is the most updated that is available meaning that daily we are at least daily actually twice a day we update information based on certification and daily we are uh, reducing that list by the students who have completed a a COVID test. Um, I have observed that there was a little disconnect in working with one faculty member. I'm still trying to get a little more clarity on that so that I can work with Ana Rosa Duran in enrollment to see if there is a if there is a greater glitch in the system. But there have also been some faculty who have emailed me or that we've tested and it looks like the information is coming through properly. Um, so as long as and I'll say this data is only as good as the data that some people sought. So if there is any enrollment data, and I'm, I'm not smart enough to know this, right? So I'm just saying, if there is any enrollment data or classroom data or faculty data that is not in PeopleSoft, the reporting will naturally not be accurate, right? And I don't know that that's the case, but I just want to clarify that as long as the data is in PeopleSoft, so if the student is trying to rush your class, but they're not registered, you're not going to see them on your list, right? Because they're not actually registered in PeopleSoft. That would be an example of what I'm referencing. So I, I appreciate the question, uh, Sean, in particular, uh, you, this will prompt, uh, you know, we, we were aware of this last night that there were a, a few glitches and, um, you know, at least reports that, uh, you know, students were saying one thing, the list was looking differently. So uh, what we'll do is make certain, uh, go back and uh, investigate that. We do want to push out uh, reliable data. Uh, it should be the case that when there's nobody on the list, you should be able to trust that as being accurate, right? So uh, we'll, we'll circle back on that, take that as uh, a point that we need to be uh, mindful of. But our goal really is to give you something that you can rely on uh, every day at the, at the beginning as you begin your classes. Uh, have some accurate information, you know, on your phone, right? That'll help you make those kinds of decisions. Yeah. So I guess I guess the the, the concern is that there's there's I don't know anybody that's gotten any positive notifications, and and many people that have had students tell them. So I think it seems to be more than I totally hear you okay. that it's complex and it's it's a there's things can go wrong, but it does not. It seems to be more systematic than that. And I would just suggest that okay. we're we're about ready to start planning for the next series of courses and it's it's hard as a chair to plan when we don't have you know do we have a little spike when we opened up and then things have dropped back down or things so it's it's um it's very difficult to field okay. questions so okay i made my point thank you 
Okay, yeah, that, that's good to know. Right. Sean, so nothing's populating? No one has anything populating in their app, huh? Can, can I ask if, if anyone on this call has had uh, something populate in one of their classes or heard of a colleague? So we're not outing anybody. It could be, I heard of a colleague who has a student on, on a list. I, I All I've heard is exactly as Sean said, a whole lot of faculty saying nobody's on my list. So anybody on the call have somebody on their list or know a friend who's got a, anybody? I mean, I'll, I'll take it a step further, Greg, and I'll say that there are a lot of people, like in community time, we're saying their courses don't even populate on those lists. And so That's I think there's, there's a lot of concern that that technology is even working, and it's come up a bunch of times just in the, the chat today. So if, if maybe we could take this conversation offline and, and, and dig that dig down on that, and then um, the officers can send an update after the meeting just to yeah. make sure that's working. That'd be great. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Really appreciate that feedback. Okay. And, and just to be clear on, on that, when, when we log into that screen, there's a little drop-down menu that looks like it should have all our class sections on it. And as, as far as I know, nothing nothing's really propagating there. Okay. So it, it kind of looks like, oh, that's a place where I check each of my classes, and there's nothing there. Now, maybe that's as intended, Right. If if nobody is on the list, then then those those classes aren't there. So that's that's just the kind of thing we're talking about. Also, I I if 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 the administration has an answer and wants to email it directly without going through me, that's totally fine too. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to forward anything. On okay. It. So we'll, 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 we'll get to work on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. And I. I think, Sean, I think we kind of got all your questions answered there. I don't yeah, want to thank skip you. over Yeah, no, no, this. no, thank you. Thank you for those responses. Thank you. Okay, okay, we're, we're good. So, I, Cindy Sherman, I see your hand. I want to go back to Jason Miller and just see, did did anybody ask to get on that list? Uh, yeah, so, um, Cindy, I'll put you on.